Good morning, church. Good morning. What a glorious day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand together as we prepare our hearts to worship and sing. Psalm 95, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. Belong to him. The sea is his for he has made it and his hands formed the dry land. Dry land. Come. Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his, under his care. Today, let's sing, rejoice, give glory to God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's sing together this morning.
Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see you all this morning, folks. I'm Pastor Roy Gearhart. Why don't you take a moment and tell somebody there beside you that you're sure enough glad that they came to sit next to you. Go ahead. Tell them most of the time nobody will sit with you. Yeah, thank them for that. All right, praise God. Ah, it's good to hear a nice, happy, ex and excited crowd out here this morning. We have some happy things to uh, celebrate. There's lots of really wonderful things going on. And uh, in fact, we've got, uh, you may remember, what was it, just a week ago? Seems like longer. Probably to them it seems even longer. But we prayed over a group of uh, guys that we sent off to uh, Mississippi that was two weeks ago, two Sundays ago. Okay, it was longer then. And, uh, but I uh, sent them off to Mississippi, and they, uh, they, they arrived back, though, and are here this morning. So I'm going to invite them up in just a moment to share just a quick um, hot mic kind of uh, what, what did they experience and uh, what was God doing. And uh, in order to welcome them up here, though, I'm going to promote another event that we have coming up in May with a group called Trampolines. And I'm going to play them because this is like Ken Smith's favorite uh, pop rock fusion group, okay? And so, uh, guys, if we, can, if we can roll that promo video for Trampolines, that would be awesome. And the guys will be coming on up then that went to... Uh, Being a Christian is the least boring thing being a christian is the being a christian is the least boring thing on the planet jesus 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 Kids jumping around and screaming Jesus at the top of their lungs. Trampolines are just different. Everything that they say, they proclaim to do or believe in or care about, they show. Highly recommend them. Their show is top notch. I've booked them for the fifth time over two and a half years. God has a plan for you, but you have to do it. You have to take it. You are Waymaker, Miracle Worker. Like I never wanted to touch drugs again. as the pastor of the church knowing that when we write you a check that the proceeds from that is also going to go to foreign missions in countries and places we'll never go. How much they care about people. Each and every single person that came out to the show that wanted to meet them, uh, talk to them, pray with them. Um, you know, a festival looking to bring in a band that is high energy that's going to get people to, to move, get people excited, get people engaged. Trampolines will do it. Who they really are. Um, before the concerts, after the concerts, they're out in the crowds. They're visiting with people. They're praying over people. I encourage you to get the trampolines, and I can't wait to have them back. And there is hope. If you forget everything else that we've said today, 
please don't forget that. All right. Good. Come on up, guys. You guys, come on up for, uh, that headed off to the Mississippi. Okay. All right. Nathan's modeling some merch from uh, trampolines, and uh, they will have merch available that weekend and everything. Come on up here, guys. Ken, tell them, uh, tell the folks why this is your uh, favorite uh, uh, rock pop fusion uh, group. Well, I, I'm not into that style of music, but <laughs> you know, I'm into these people. And I was just talking to a gentleman uh, this week, a man by the name of Ben Fuller. I don't know if you've ever heard any of Ben Fuller's music or not. He's more of the, the country style Christian artist. And I got to talk with him a little bit, but about three years ago, he pulled a name out of a jar for somebody to win a hotel stay. And the name he pulled out was Penny Smith. So that started something rolling. Because of him doing that, I got to meet Lane and Carrie, who are trampolines. And we've become friends, that was three years ago. I get text messages, phone calls and stuff from them all the time, you know, wanting to know how we're doing. And we've been to several of their concerts and so on, but just an amazing couple because their heart is for other people and for the Lord. They, they want to see people saved. And Lane goes and Carrie both go around the world. Matter of fact, they're in the Ukraine right now, you know, helping people. That's what they do six months out of the year. They go around helping people overseas mostly. And the other six months, they come to places like Galloway Church, like they're going to be here the 4th of May. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you guys are going to love them. Just All super. Right. That's awesome. And we're going to have a blast because we're going to have a concert on Saturday night. And then they're going to be here on Sunday morning to talk testimony and ministry with us and what they're doing. So we're going to be blessed. And these guys, though... They, they, you guys went off to Mississippi with our prayers to be blessed and to be a blessing. And uh, so I was listening to a couple of guys talking earlier about stuff. And so we're going to catch them a quick hot mic kind of, hey, fresh off of the uh, pickup truck to uh, tell us about uh, what, what they did down Mississippi. Who wants to start it off? You can each have a quick run at it. All right. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm not a construction guy. I was out of my element, um, and they knew it. <laughs> but um, it, we, we worked, and we had praise time. And one of the best things uh, that those people went through, one gentleman was there. He'd lost his son and his granddaughter, lost his house, had to sell his cattle because he had no f fences left to keep them in. Um, a year later, it seemed like it was so much mass destruction even after a year. Um, he and his grandson were there and sang Amazing Grace and praise God, even through all that trial and temptation. I learned a lot down there. There was, a, you can't believe how the people down in a tornado zone how it affects them. I mean, they lose everything. And you don't realize what everything is until you, I guess you got it done to you. But to help them, it really makes you feel good. And if anyone can ever get to go on a mission trip, go for it. It's well worth it. All the praise, it's super. Little brother. <coughs> biggest thing I learned on this trip is uh, folks losing things and then finding things. That kind of meant a lot to me because I can't uh, stand up here and tell you a bunch about it. But anyhow, my dad passed away. I found a hammer, went down to those folks down there and uh, worked with some folks. They were painters and caulkers from Restoration Ministry. And uh, 
Some guys had some hard times in life, and I'll tell you what, they've lost some things, but also they found some things. And it was just a real blessing to work with those folks. Uh, my, just, uh, just the stories that they have and the folks we worked with on their houses uh, really, really touched me. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a real blessing as well. Uh, we're kind of a serious bunch. So, uh, yeah, we got down there and they basically called us the Hee Haw Gang. I'm not going to go into that. Not going to go into that a whole lot, but believe you me, from 4.30 in the morning till about 9.30 at night, it was just game on and laughing. I mean, just, just a real blessing to be with these guys. Uh, I've, I've not known them real deep, but boy, I'll tell you what, those eight days got to, got to know them, and I'll tell you, we, we had some good times and got a lot done, so I praise the Lord for that. Yeah, I think uh, this, these were the three stooges. They laughed the whole time. It was, <laughs> it was great. So the, that's the fellowship was the fun part. And then just to see 1,300 people in one tent that were all fired up for Jesus and good devotionals in every day, twice a day, good praise, and, um, and then the opportunity to work with, to see poverty and destruction, but people having hope and be able to give them some hope by what we could do for them. That was a neat thing. I've always been used to going on these trips by myself or with my family, and now I have more family. An older brother. <laughs> and three younger brothers. <laughs> But uh, yes, we had a wonderful time. We really, uh, you know, praising the Lord just constantly, you know, for eight days, even while we're out working, it's just a praise time. It, it was, and working with people from all over the country. I actually met a, met a gentleman that went to the same church that I did back in the 70s. Only he was a little bit younger. He was in the youth group then. <laughs> but uh, it was like, and he's, he, now he's a deacon in that church. So it was like, you know, just surprised. But how God works and moves through the lives of people, even in disaster, is amazing. But just to give you a recap of uh, what went on down there, we had over 1,500 volunteers throughout that time. They completed 353 tasks. Each job is considered a task. 28 homes were painted. 22 full roofs were put on. And uh, 62 homes were completed back to where they could be uh, totally livable and so on again. And 122 families were served during that time. So we just <laughs> praise God. Wow. Thank you so much for your prayers and continue to pray for the people that are down there. They're still working on three houses? Seven houses. Seven houses. They're still built from, from ground up during the week. They have the roofs on, but they have a lot of inside work to do still. So pray for the work and uh, continue to support them. Thank you. I think the Lord answered our prayers. Amen. You guys came back blessed with eternal blessings, and you guys left some eternal blessings. There's going to be people laughing in heaven someday because of you. <laughs> but there's blessings. So you guys talked about that, being able to share and witness the gospel with other workers, with other people, with all those things, and just impact their lives with some touch of hope. And so um, I think we need to just give God thanks. Almighty God, we're, going to, we're just going to thank you. Thank you for answering our prayers, that these guys all went and came back safe and sound. Thank you, O oh God, that they have come back enriched in their lives and blessed, that your Holy Spirit, God, ministered in their lives in ways that will have eternal impact. I want to thank you, God, that you sent them and they were able to do work. They, ever, they were able to put their hands to work and do things that gave people blessings and hope, hope to press on, hope, God, that, uh, that you were able to send them uh, rescuers. And God, we just want to thank you for the testimony and witness of their lives. 
that they were able to go and bring joy and bring blessing, oh God. And we're, we're trusting you that God someday, just this little quick hot mic kind of interview with them, that one day we're going we're gonna to get to stop in someday in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the heavens and in, in the streets of gold, and we're going we're gonna to be walking along, and somebody is going to say, yeah, I, I, I was blessed back there in 2024, March. And it's like, yeah, you know that guy? Yeah. Boy, he blessed me. God, I want to thank you for answering those prayers and, and giving us something that we're going to look forward to even more. And God, we just want to commit our hearts to you to continue to send forth people who will be uh, uh, missionaries and workers and, and uh, bring your blessing. We want to pray, God, for the people there. And as Glenn asked us to continue to pray for those who are in need. And this is just one spot in the world. But God, can we take that one spot into our hearts and pray for them? that you, God, would continue a work until it is completed there. We just lift up our hearts to you, God, with gratitude and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was great. What a wonderful way to have our day underway in the presence of Jesus and to be sharing uh, together as the body of Christ. We're going to continue in prayer and in uh, worship this morning. And as we do, I want to invite you to take time to pray. We're, this whole month is a focal point on prayer to be able to pray and seek after God. We've been through that pause, rejoice. Today it's all focused on ask, and next week on yielding to God in prayer. But let's, let's take that to heart to ask. Let's ask and see what God would do. I want to urge you today that as we continue in our next worship set to come and to pray and to seek God, you can get on your knees, just have some space with God here. And if you'd like someone to lay hands on you, join with you in prayer, just go to one of these two kneelers right here in the front. We'll wrap around you in prayer and lift you up and your knees up before the Lord this morning. But let's take these next couple of songs. Let's just have this moment to pursue God in prayer together this morning. Let's stand together. Psalm 16. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with your joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Dear ones, so many times we take a lot of things in this world and try to fill our lives with it. We try to, to make ourselves happy and find joy and peace and, and contentment with the things of the world. It's not going to happen. Only Jesus, only God, only the Lord God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is the one that will fill us, will fill us with that contentment and joy. So let's praise and worship him this morning. Give him the glory. And if there are things you need to give him and let him push out those other things, let's give it to him this morning.
work to the church that is praiseworthy. I believe all the people that we have had in the hospital in the last months are home. We've had an instance where Lorraine Slogan was in the hospital for three weeks. She's home. News wasn't great, but she's dealing with Jean Mung has been in the hospital since Thanksgiving. Last Friday, she came home, something that she strived to do, and thanks you for the prayers that you've given to for her. Mrs. Sutton has been in the hospital the last couple of weeks, and she's now home. She's dealing with heart issues, now everybody that we know is back home and anytime I visit anybody in the hospital their desire is to be home even when it's their last days they want to be home but this congregation I know when we put out prayer requests the people could feel the prayers that you give them understanding that we all have aches and pains and people within our families that are suffering. It's endless. But yet we as a congregation know that we have a Savior that cares for us in all those things, all those miseries. We don't understand why it happens or why it happens to us. Some people go in and have knee replacements and are walking in a week and having no pain. And others suffer for weeks to get back on their feet again. And they're constantly praying for God to give them the healing that they need and asking you to step in for it. And I as one can understand that people do actually feel the prayers that you give them and they thank you for that. That is the strength that God has given us as a group of people in this situation. Just like the men going to Mississippi, what a wonderful experience to be able to see. Something has been totally destructed and rebuilt again, put people's homes back together. It's wonderful for me and Carol to know that you support everybody that is part of this congregation. We thank you. You all may be seated. Um, this morning, Mary Lee Fackle is going to bless us with a uh, song. She uh, asked if she could sing this, and it just goes absolutely perfect with what we're talking about this morning in the Lord's, in the Lord's Word. So, Mary Lee's going to share. for blessing us this morning. This is a song that I learned years ago, and when it was shared with me, it really meant a lot. And so I asked if I could share it with you this morning. Um, I'm going to borrow a few words from uh, today's turning point from Dr. Jeremiah, which was on last Friday. Uh, this is just a few words from the devotional. It says, remember... God is always near and working on our behalf. When we see immediate answers to our prayers, we should rejoice. When he doesn't answer us immediately, we should trust. The time we spend in prayer is precious because we are entering into and recognizing the presence of God for whom nothing is impossible. Give him time to work. 
I know there are times when we don't know how to pray, and all we need to do is speak the name of Jesus. When it seems that you've prayed till your strength is all gone and your tears fall like raindrops all the day long, Jesus cares and he knows just how much you can bear. He'll speak your name to someone in prayer. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. And when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Have the clouds round you gathered in the midst of the storm is your ship tossed and battered are you weary and worn don't lose hope someone's praying for you this very day and peace be still is already on the praying for you. Someone is praying for you. And when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. And when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Mary Lee, would you serve today as today's designated prayer? Grab your microphone, bring it right along. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege to pray. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and to uh, worship you. We lift Pastor Roy to you now as he brings your word to us. And we just pray that uh, your spirit will be within him and that we each will be strengthened and lifted to continue on our journey with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary Lee. We're going to dismiss the kids to Kids Zone right now. And so kids are heading off to Kids Zone. All right, look at them go. I love to see these kids who are like run to the back because they're ready to roll out there. Praise God. All right. Uh, praise the Lord. We didn't bring our offering forward and present it. I hope that the ushers don't feel incomplete in their task today. Uh, nope, they're up there ready to go. I don't want them to go home feeling like they didn't finish their job. Let's just sing it out. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. They're going to bring her down here and say it. Come on. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. Blessings, blessings, and blessings you have poured upon us. And thank you, God, that somebody is praying for us. That we, we have people praying for each other here in this crowd. That we have people that you move upon to pray in uh, surprising ways. And Lord, uh, we're grateful whenever we are aware of that, that somebody's praying for us. And so, Lord, for all of the things that you are doing in our midst, we are grateful and would lift up our hearts to you today with thanksgiving for these offerings that, are, that you've given us the ability and the desire to, to share. We want to praise you, God, for the ways in which you are completing our mission in uh, the financial realm, uh, the responsibilities and demands that we have there. Thank you, God, for the energy that you give us day in and day out that we need and require. Thank you, God, for your healing grace. Thank you. Let your blessing, I pray now, rest on us as we would seek your face through your word with a longing to know, God, how to pray. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you all. All right, praise God. We're going to be... Uh, we're going to be diving into the scripture once again as we continue on our prayer emphasis this month, looking at it through that uh, acronym PRAY, P-R-A-Y, pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. So this week we're up to ask. We've been, uh, we've been working through the pause. Uh, Psalm, 46, Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. And so that we, we realize we need to pause. We need to actually stop. It, it, it raised the question for us in uh, Bible study on Wednesday as we met. I re, you know, the question came out of that. You know, can you say that you pray all the time? Like some people will say, oh, I just pray all the time. But can you say I pray all the time if I never stop and pray? You chew on that one. Can you say that you pray all the time if you never stop and pray and give God attention and time? Uh, we talked about rejoicing last week, and man, the, that, that, man, that brought the question to life. Uh, how do you rejoice whenever things are really bad? Where do you find something to praise God for when there's no... Isn't that too minuscule for God to bother with? Isn't it diminishing God to think that we could pray for a parking space or pray for, uh, you know, the money to pay our bills or, or worse, yeah, the money for a gift or, or for a, something that I just want. I know it's not on the needs list. I just want it. Does it diminish God for us to ask God for those little things and for those things that are just our own personal desire and wish and want some of what we wrestled with and that was was really leading to the conclusion of no it's not diminishing god maybe it diminishes god more if we make god only the god of the special occasions i'll handle the rest of life it's only when it's a big thing that i'll go and talk to god about it it's only when it's really over my head. Then I can pray, but I won't bother God the rest of the time. Maybe then we've really diminished God because maybe then we've made God the God of the special occasions, but the God then that is ignored most of the rest of the time. Maybe that's where we end up landing whenever we make God the God of the special event. I stop in at God's house and check in with him once a week. 
and then go on with the rest of my life as if God was still back at the house and I'm out there doing my thing on my own. You see, whenever you let God out of the little things, the everyday things, the, the things that you think, oh, I can handle this on my own, God begins to get a smaller and smaller role where you're saying, no, no, I'm only going after God for the big things. You actually may be making God the God of the small space of your life. You see, it gets challenging to us as we begin to ask those kinds of questions you know, the truth is, Jesus told us that we ought to ask God for things. So, number one, we can say that we are invited. We are even bid by him to ask. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Think the words through. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. That's like the first ask. Or maybe that's the first stride of surrender in our lives. Your kingdom come. You're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the king of me, the Lord of me. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to rule over me. That may be our first stride of, of surrender, but it is our first ask. I want your kingdom to come. That's a good prayer in the midst of a political season, by the way. A good prayer to say over and over again, yes, let your kingdom come because our kingdom stinks. Our kingdom's run by the jesters. Let your kingdom come. I want you to be in charge. I want you to rule over my life. Maybe then we steal it back from all the merch dealers who want to own us and own every aspect of our life. Work for all the things that we would sell you. Maybe it's time to buy it back and say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth here, this earth, this, this little square space of earth where I'm standing. Let your kingdom come, right? But, but he goes on, he goes on. Jesus said, you keep asking, your kingdom come, please let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then what does he say that we should pray? What's the next line? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then what? Give us. Okay, now we're getting down to the business of asking, aren't we? Give us this day our daily bread. Bread is always in the Bible this symbol of basic daily sustenance. I know some of you on a low-carb diet are saying, I wish I could have bread. That's my prayer. Give me bread today. Yeah, right. No, bread is like that basic daily sustenance. And Jesus says, go ahead and say that. Give us today our daily bread. Then he says what? Forgive us. Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our debts. Forgive us the wrong, the messed up things of our life. Forgive us as we forgive others. Oh, can we skip over that part? No. Jesus, in, in Matthew's gospel, in the sixth chapter, Jesus actually pulls that part out and comments on it and says, uh, just so you don't try to skip over that part, I want to emphasize to you that the way you forgive, that's the way you're going to get forgiven. That's what I mean. <gasps> this just got nasty now. It's like, wait a minute, I don't want to do, well, that's a whole other thing. Let's just stick to asking God for what we need, right? Forgive us our sins as we, oh, that as we forgive. Oh, man, it sounds like we're going to need help with that too. That better be an ask. Forgive us our sins, and please, Lord, help me to forgive others. But he takes us into our daily bread. He says, ask for daily bread. He takes us into our sin, and he says, ask God for forgiveness. He takes us then into facing all of the different struggles in our life. And what does he say? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, Lord, help us, please. 
Help me to not succumb to temptation. Number one, help me to avoid falling into temptation. Help me to not fall into sin and deliver us from evil. God, rescue us from the harm that evil would bring. Deliver us from the bondage that it would bring to body, mind, and soul. Deliver us, rescue us from the harm that this world delivers on on a regular basis. We're asking God for some real basic things, aren't we? In the Lord's Prayer. So he says, ask, go ahead, ask. Ask me. Ask me about your daily bread. Ask me for forgiveness. Ask me for the guidance and protections that would keep us from pursuing our, the, the, the sin and, the, and falling under all of the harm that this world delivers. Yes, we should ask for all of those things. Do you realize that in the scripture, we're in fact told that if we don't ask God, we might just miss out on blessings. And worse, we can end up in a space where we start trying to satisfy our daily bread needs, avoiding problems, having a good time in life, and we start to follow our own designs and only make things worse. In the book of James, in the fourth chapter, in James chapter 4, it says in uh, verses 1 to 3, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Good question. Answer, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. That's not a very nice picture of life, is it? I want this, I want that. Give me my daily bread. Give me, a, give me the things that I want. In fact, lead me into temptation so that I can have what I want. <laughs> that's, that's more like the kind of prayers that we really pursue. And it's like, and, but he said, look, you want stuff and you try to satisfy it on your own and you end up just fighting with each other, quarreling, being driven mad by all these things that you want. And then what does he say? James says, you do not have because you do not ask God. You just don't ask. Now, there is the cautionary note that comes after that saying, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So you're just a selfish putz. You know? That's, you know, you just, that's all that it is. I just want what I want, and that's all I want. I'm, I genuinely am praying, Lord, lead me into satisfying the temptations that I prefer. Deliver me up to all of the pleasures that I want, seek, and desire. Just make sure that I'm happy and healthy and comfortable. And, and, you know, God becomes this precious deliverer like a slot machine that we just pull the lever and stuff falls out in our laps. That's the picture that many of us have of what God would be like if he was really great. James cautions us about that and says, do you remember where we started all this? What causes quarrels and fights among you? Oh, that's right. Your selfish, self-serving attitude where you try to solve all your own problems and then you end up just scrapping with people, fighting, bickering, carrying on, having all these battles, trying to make things work, trying to get where you need to be. And listen, that doesn't all start off with, you know, drug addiction, or prostitution, or all kinds of, you know, let's, let's just name our big, biggest hit list of sins. It just starts off with simple things. I want daily bread. I want the normal things in life. And I want somebody to deliver on it. I'm entitled to it. That's all it starts with. It's not freakish. It's just normal. And then we try to solve it on our own, and we end up slaves to sin, in the grips of evil, struggling within ourselves to come to peace. Because I don't know about you, well, I could pretty much guess, though, is that the desires that we have within us well, Ephesians 4 describes them. It says they, be, they become something that feed with a continual lust for more. 
The sensual desires that we have, they just feed on us with a continual lust for more. And that's why we become imprisoned in sin. That's why we become entrapped in trying to solve our own problem because we keep trying to find an answer for it by our own means. And those means always leave us with still, I'm still trying to find that finish line. I just need a little more. I just want more security. I just want more to make sure that I have enough. I just want more around me so that I don't feel less than everyone else. I want more of these. And we just get caught in that. And it all starts in real simple, normal things sin doesn't have to start with you as a drug addict and and some sort of wild uproarious no it just grabs a hold of you where you just don't bother to seek god and you seek to fulfill your own aims and then you get sucked into it with a continual need to find another answer another hit another source of security because we don't trust God to be there with bread every day. That was the funny thing about manna, you remember. You remember manna back in the wilderness? God leading the people with Moses from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the Holy Land, in their promised land? And he, sa and he says, I'm going to feed you. You ask me for food, so I'm going to feed you. But the catch was that manna showed up every morning. You had to pick it up for that day. And if you tried to save more for the next day, it spoiled. So give us this day our daily bread became a daily prayer, became a daily seeking after God, became a daily pursuit of him. You see, James is so practical. Everything that James goes after in speaking in, the, in that little tiny book of five chapters is always so practical, and it hits you right where you're living. You fight, you squabble. You, and How many of you have even internal squabbles over things? This is what I started to say earlier, and I got distracted myself, is that, you know, you, you have all these things that you want, and then do you have pro I have a terrible problem. I, I'm, a, I'm a squirrel chaser. Everybody who knows me well knows that. And, and it's like every time I decide what I want, then I, I look at another catalog and I want something else. Or if I don't get it right away, then, wow, new ideas occur. I want this one. I want this model instead of that model. I want, I want this new and improved instead of that old one from last year, for heaven's sake. You know, and it's like, oh. Sometimes, don't you end up feeling like, I don't even know what I want. Because every time I turn around, I want something different. This is the other part of what gets us on the hook draws us in, and man, you're like chasing smoke, trying to grab a hold of it. And James is alerting us to that, that it's like, man, if you keep living like that, you're just going to keep living into this mess, and so God is not going to become servant to that mess. He actually wants to produce something else, so ask ask God, but do it with right motives. Now, that starts to open us up to this is that in prayer, there is an meeting place with God that is not just then about saying, I get to tell God what I want, and if I believe it hard enough, that God has to give it. That's a sick doctrine that some people do pr promote. If I just believe it hard enough, then God's going to make it happen. And that's just not true. And thank God it isn't. Because when, if that's the way that everything works, then God is going to put an idiot in charge. Like me. Or you. And it's like, we want to put God in charge. That's the whole point. Ask God, not just yourself. That's the huge flaw in that kind of teaching. That says that if you just believe it hard enough that God is going to deliver and it's like, not if what you're asking is just your dumb idea and nobody should do what you just asked. That would be ridiculous. There was some country song, which, you know, country songs are well known for their super wisdom. And there, but there's a country song that says, you know, some of God's, uh, how's that song go? It's like, our unanswered prayers. Some of God's Greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Something like that. That is wisdom. 
You know, one time I prayed that God would have a girl like me. I did. Back in high school, I was desperate. Yeah, you know it. And uh, I was desperate, and I prayed, oh, Jesus, I just want this girl to like me. Yes, Jesus, that girl, that one right there, that one. And then she did. And then I ran. <laughs> it was hilarious. I mean, I look back on that, and I think, how hilarious. I wanted so badly for her to like me, and as soon as I got that whispered, she died from somebody, I don't know. All of a sudden, I was like, no! That was the last time I ever did that. I started to say, God, I'm never going to ask you for that one again. You pick. You lead me. It's the truth. That's the truth. I'm not making that up. Yeah, we need to find that out. You see, here's the thing, that prayer allows us to get to know God. It allows us to come into his presence and to abide there. The fact is, in John 15, Jesus said this, John 15, 7 and 8, it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, a lot of us want to zero in on the part where he says, and you will get what you ask for. Yes! This is what we've been looking for the whole time. Where do we get to the place where I get what I ask for? Well, when you get to the part that says you abide in him and his word abides in you. And when the result of that then is in turn, and here you show yourself to be my disciples. What does that mean? Let's, let's stop and think about that for a second. My disciples, people who go to church on Sunday. Yes, I will show myself to be somebody who goes to church on Sunday. No, that's not what disciple means. What does disciple literally mean? Someone who follows some, get it right, someone who follows Jesus. That is what it literally is about. A disciple follows the master. And so that this is where you show yourself to be my disciples and you will bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now that's emphatic because most of the things that I have on my wish list are wants that will spoil if not kept refrigerated, that will fall apart if not protected from the elements, that are all of these earthly things that don't last very long. And so that this is where he says, I, I, get the, the wrap around on this, ask and you'll receive. When you are abiding in me and my word is abiding in you, you will ask and the result of that will be that you will show that you are my disciples. You're actually following me. And you will bear fruit that will last. Now that's a wraparound that you can't slip away from. It tells us that being in prayer is something that allows us to get to know God and that will also have an impact upon ourselves. It will have an impact upon knowing ourselves and upon, in fact, who we are and how we live. That's the thing is that prayer, at its essence, is about getting to know God and getting to know ourselves at the same time in His presence, in this context of our relationship with Him. And so that prayer actually allows us to draw near and to get close. You see, the truth is, is what we said at the start, oftentimes we just don't really seem to know how we ought to pray or what we ought to pray. In Romans 8, verses 26 through 29, it says precisely that and gives us God's answer. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. He, and he who searches our hearts 
knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You see, the end result of this is that we would be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, that we would be like Jesus as children of God, living, following after Christ, after the Father as Christ did, and so that this was what he would produce. But this starts with the fact that you and I don't really know God, and we actually don't really know ourselves all that well. Hence, our, I want this and then I want that. Hence, I want this, I got that, now I'm not happy. God is there working in your life and in mine saying, you don't know. You don't know what you want. You don't know how to pray. You don't know what to ask for. You don't know what's going on. That's why you need to abide in me and let my word abide in you. This is why you need to come into my presence. Where? Did you get the picture? The Holy Spirit, it says, searches out our hearts. And at the same time, is there knowing then the mind of the Lord? And thus is bringing us together into the presence of the Lord in a way that we could begin to pray and know the Father in keeping with his will. That's what it said, that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us in keeping with the will of God. So that this divine connection is being made in our lives through the presence of his Holy Spirit. Who gets the Holy Spirit? Those who believe and receive Jesus Christ receive his Holy Spirit. Now, you and I then are to abide in him, let his word abide in us, that his Holy Spirit would be able to work and engage with us in this relationship with God so that the Holy Spirit would get into us and search out our hearts and connect us with God in keeping with his will. Very straightforward, isn't it? This is what the work of prayer is really engaging us in. So many of us have spent our lives believing that prayer was mostly about how do I ask God for something and get what I ask for? Well, here's the real answer. Let the Holy Spirit abide in you, his word abide in you. Let that settle into you. Be his disciple and let him draw you into the presence of the Father in keeping with the Father's will. And you'll be responsive to God. You'll be led by him. You'll be asking God things and you'll be knowing his will and seeing him answer in ways that will demonstrate, yes, you are my disciple. Yes, there's fruit going to come forth in your life now, fruit that will last. Those are the things that come forth in this dynamic of relationship with God through Spirit working in you and me. It tells you this, then. Prayer, sometimes we focus on solely as a methodology thing that we're looking for. And I, I got to say, you know, this, uh, this book that I have uh, recommended to you, connected with How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People by Pete Gregg, has been a really cool book, and he talks about methodology. He talks about how to approach God in prayer, but he does it without losing sight of the fact that the methodology is only a tool. The technique is only, you know, a, a thing that helps us to kind of position ourselves into that relationship with God through his Holy Spirit. And that if we practice a methodology without that, then it's fruitless and it's pointless. Too many times we've focused on it, though, as just the thing that says, I need to find out how to ask God for what I want and get an answer. Really get the answer that I want is what we have longed for. And we've missed the point. Many times we've just missed the boat. The real enterprise of prayer is to know and to be known by God, to know God and to be known by God, and even to know ourselves there in his presence. Remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well, Samaritan woman there at the well, and they were talking. Let me just share with you a little bit of this. There was a point at which Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. And she said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, is you've had five husbands and the man you now have uh, is not your husband. What you said is just, just now is quite true. 
I, I, I've told you this before, but year, years gone by, I used to think Jesus was like going, gotcha. Kind of a smart aleck. Gotcha. Because this lady was like putting them off and putting them off and being, being kind of, uh, you know, unreceptive to say the least, and, and uh, with good reasons, really, in a lot of respects. But, but Jesus is not just doing that. What Jesus is doing is what he does with us whenever we're talking with him. He will reach into our heart and soul. His spirit searches out our spirit, it said in Romans 8. This is where God is working in you and me to bring to the surface what is it that you really want. And while you're here in my presence, let's work on that. What is it that you really, really want? This is something that, that really is, is in place that God is, is growing us as a person. What is it that you really want? There are lots of times that I've just gone along in life and not bothered to really talk to God about what I want or what I need. Like James says, we just don't bother to ask God, or we only ask God whenever we're feeling particularly selfish, and then we get motivated to ask God. I remember uh, years ago, Bethany's here with us this morning, and, you know, Bethany was the instrument of taking us on one of the, really, the best trip that I've ever taken in my life. When she was in Lithuania for three years as a missionary, um, she kept telling us about this place called Hill Crosses. There was great longing that it brought to my heart to want to go and see that, visit this special place and stuff like that. And, but while she was there, I had made up my mind that Janice and I couldn't afford to go over there. We couldn't afford you know, $1,500 plane tickets, and we just weren't going to go. I think I've told you this before, but some of you haven't heard it, and most of you forgot it. And... Um, but we just decided we couldn't do it. So do you know what I did? I never asked God. Not once. I, don't, I really, I don't think I ever asked God. I had done the math. I couldn't do it. Off the list. Forget it. Just be satisfied. I was uh, traveling as an evangelist at a time, and I was, I was uh, preaching at... Uh, a church, and uh, a couple took me out to lunch, and they were asking me all about Bethany, and they were asking me over and over again, why are you going to go? Why are you going to go over there and visit with her? And there was something about their probing and their questioning that stirred up something in me that I began to wonder, are these people like leading up to something? And whenever I went back to my room that evening, I was feeling incredibly guilty about that. I was feeling very selfish. I was feeling like I'm starting to wonder if these people are going to offer to buy us tickets, and I'm starting to be like, yeah, that would be awesome. And then I'm starting to feel incredibly guilty and ashamed of myself, and I'm laying there on my bed, and I'm chastising myself and saying, you selfish putts. But as I was there in the presence of Jesus, and he broke in on all of that, and he said, well, have you ever asked me? And I said, no. Not once. Nope, I didn't ask you. Nope, I didn't want to be selfish. I didn't want to be uh, expecting something. I didn't want to ask for something that I didn't think could happen. I didn't want to ask for something that I knew I couldn't make it happen. I didn't want to ask for something like that. So I didn't. And I laid there in that bed, and I just finally, with the Father prompting me, I just said, okay, the truth is, I would really love to go and visit her while she's over there. Yes, I would. I really, really would. And the next day, they, next day, these people said, hey, we've decided we're going to buy your tickets and we're going to send you over there. And it was the best ticket trip I've ever had in my life.
And the father was teaching me about asking. You know, there, uh, let me be real honest. Back in the uh, day, and we, we'd talk about this in our Bible study group, you know, there was a lot of times that I would say uh, caveats to prayer. You know, you say, okay, God, I want to pray for this person to be healed if it be thy will. And we'd just throw that tagline on there all the time. Hashtag, if it be your will, you know. And it would just be like that little thing there because, and part of it was motivated by humility of saying, Father, I want to make sure that I'm praying in your will. But part of it was also my get out of jail free card because when God didn't answer that prayer, then it was like, see, God didn't want it to happen, so I'm off the hook. That's the truth. And it was also this thing of, 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 a, of basically admitting that in my heart of hearts, I didn't think I could know what God's will was, so hey, whatever your will is, because I don't have a clue. So I used to put that caveat on there, saying, Lord, if it be thy will, and I would feel guilty about it because I knew that it was my expression of faithlessness, it was also my expression of just feeling lost and confused of knowing what God's will was, but uh, trying to pray. Over the years, God has been teaching me that, one, you need to ask. Don't be shy or bashful about it. Ask. Go to God and ask. Ask him, God, here's what I really, really want. And let me tell you, though, that if you spend some time in God's presence talking with him about what you really, really want, and you really, really are seeking him, his spirit will get invasive in that process, will become invasive to your heart and soul and begin to reach for things that you were not carrying around on your superficial prayer list. Not the superficial stuff. Of God, I hope that uh, today is a good day, the sun shines, uh, that it rains only appropriately, and you know things like that. God will dig into you deeper than that and say, what is it you really want? And when you get into those spaces with God, suddenly you'll start to, in his presence, say, God, you know what I really want? I really would like to have a pure mind that wasn't perverted. Some of you boys know what I'm saying. Some of you men know what I'm saying. Girls, I think, are pure. I don't know. But I know that guys aren't. And sometimes you get in the presence of Jesus and all of a sudden you start saying, Father, I want to be clean. I want to have a pure mind. I don't want to fight those same battles. Sometimes you get in the presence of Jesus, and all of a sudden, like Isaiah, when he saw the Lord on his throne, all of a sudden he started to cry out and say, God, I'm a man of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips. Please clean my mouth. Please clean my mouth. Please Stop me from cursing and from muttering and bitterness. God, please deliver me. You get in the presence of Jesus and he'll sink under the surface and start to say, I want to free you from that bitterness that you are constantly living in. I want to free you from that unforgiveness that owns your soul and your mind. I want to get you out of this ugly place of, of heartache and brokenness that you're living in. I want to elevate you out of that. I want to, but we're going to have to bring it to the surface. We're going to have to get it right up to the ground level. We're going to have to get it out there where all the surface things are. We're going to have to bring it there where finally you will acknowledge it and Christ will enter into it with you. And God is reaching into our lives like that. This is what he wants to do as you would abide in him and he in us. And what he will do is transform you. Little by little, little by little. You think that prayer is something that if you take a 101 class and then a 202 class and then a 303 class and then a 404 class, now you're a master of prayer, you're wrong. You take all of those classes, but until you are living in it, until you are living in prayer, until you are living in that hungry desire to know God, you don't know nothing yet. You know all kinds of rules, regulations, methodologies, guidances, steps that other people follow, but unless you are willing to abide in him, let his word abide in you, you're never going to know what you're talking about with prayer. You're never going to be a great prayer. You're never going to be able to know his 
purpose and power. But if you will abide in him, even without taking all the classes, the Father will teach you and guide you and deepen you and mature you to know him, to know his will, and to let his spirit lift up the cries of your heart and to make them come alive in the presence of the Father in keeping with his will. And so that the Father can actually enter into your life and into your needs in a miraculous and mighty way. That's what it's really about in asking. So here, let me just finish with this. Is that what I've been learning from the Father, and it dawned on me, this is, this is where we're at. Because I don't, I don't usually use the caveat of, if it be thy will. It's just kind of like, yeah, it's understood that it's got to be your will but I think it's actually moved further that it's like I want to be in the presence of Jesus in a way that he could bring to the surface what I really, really, really want. Good, bad, or ugly, whatever it is, go ahead, bring it all out before you. I want to be able to be honest and deeply authentic with him to say this is what my desire, yes, Father, I'm asking. But I want to ask it in a way that I'm equally saying, and now, Father, that I've asked you, I really want to know what your response is. I really want to know what you have to say. You know how you ask other people for advice, and sometimes all that you want is for them to tell you that your idea was right? And then other times you go to someone who is wise and who is, you know, learned and experienced, and you say to them, here's my idea, what do you think? And you really want to know? That's, that's that abide in me and let my word abide in you. Ask. Go ahead, ask. Go ahead, ask. Even if it's dumb, ask. Even if it's selfish, ask. Go ahead, ask. Get it out there. Let his spirit bring it to the servant. Ask. But then, I want to know what you want. I want to know your will. I want to know your purpose. I want to know the next step so that I can follow you. That has to become that driver of prayer. That's what frees you and me to ask deeply, fully, even stupidly at times, but ask. And let that be overcome because we are now asking and now What is the truth? What is your will and way? I want to know that so that I can be obedient and follow you. That's where prayer takes us when we ask and want to know his will. This morning, maybe you need to do some of that before you even leave here. But I know you need to do some of that when you get home. And you may need to desperately do some of that at the first chance that you can really get alone and dive into his presence. But I invite you to crawl into his lap here this morning and let the Father prove to you that he can lead you even when you're not sure where that needs to be. together.
want to encourage you that as you uh, go today, two things. Uh, in the YouVersion app, if you've got that Bible app on your phone, if you go to the event, I've tagged a devotion that just follows along. It's great 21-day devotion that'll challenge you and encourage you in prayer. That's a good thing. But the big thing I want to send you off with today is this encouragement to take time to be in the presence of the Lord and let Him uh, just soak in to your heart and to let you ask and say, Lord, if you, if you give me a chance to ask you, this, is, this becomes something that's far different from three wishes with a genie where you're trying to figure out how do I get healthy, wealthy, and wise in three quick steps. When you get into the presence of the Lord and are asking, if I have the chance to ask you for anything, what is it that I really want? And let, the, let the Lord just kind of soak into that with you. I advise you to get yourself out a little prayer journal or something and to start writing down things that begin to rise in your heart. Just, just write them down before you're done. Write them down on something that you can hang on to. I've written some of those things down on scraps of paper that I've lost, and, I, and it pains me to, to try to remember what those things were. Sometimes I love to go back and read them again because sometimes I can see where God has taken me past that point, and I can give thanks. Sometimes I go back and say, Father, could we pick up where we left off? Because I still need you to carry me forward from there. I still have that cry in my heart. And uh, sometimes we just need to visit that again. So I just want to encourage you to get some time and let God bring it to surface. It may be one thing that really leaps to the surface. Maybe a multitude of things. I advise you to do that too when you're praying for your prodigals, for the people that are on your heart that you want to lift up. Take some time to sit there and actually start jotting down notes of all the things that start to arise. Because instead of just a bland, oh God, I pray that you would save them and that they would be blessed, keep them safe today. When you start to actually dig in with the presence of Jesus, God, what is it that I really long for? For my kids, for my spouse, for my best friend, for... It's amazing what God can raise to the surface that suddenly you have so much. Those of you who think, I couldn't pray for more than a minute and a half, you start to discover you could pray for a day and a half on those things. So I just urge you to spend some time letting God soak in your presence. And remember that the, the thing is, is to say, Lord, I'm, I want to be completely honest in asking. And then honestly, I really want to know your answer. That's one of my life verses, Ephesians 3.20. To God who can do exceedingly abundantly more than all we ask or imagine, to him be glory and honor in the church now and forevermore. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Amen.